No, I remember doing interviews with the press where, I mean, shoot, with Tim Timmons, we'd be interviewing with the press for an hour and a half. Yeah. And they'd just use, like, 15 yeah. seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, um. <laughs> Stephen, my first question to you would be this. So, what was different about the 84 legislative session from January the 13th till June uh, that was different from other sessions? And how were they different? Um, well, the first thing that you notice is just the number of people coming together and the number of organizations coming together, from Texas Normal to Patients Alliance for Cannabis Therapeutics to DFW Normal getting involved to uh, the MAMA organization and the mothers of kids. Um, and In fact, that's something we hadn't really seen much of in previous years was parents speaking out for their children. Um, they had really been put in a position of being afraid um, for a long time because you speak out for your child in Texas and you possibly feel that you're on the risk of losing them and so um, something happened uh, bet before 2015 that really got those people out of the woodwork and got them lobbying, got them politically active um, not necessarily active but politically active because we've had activism before but we never had uh, lobby days like the lobby days that we've seen in this last year as far as just the number of people coming from um, various political backgrounds, various areas of the state, various organizations. So, Do you think that uh, the successes that have been had in places like Washington and Oregon and Alaska and Colorado and Washington DC has given uh, hope? and um, uh, vitalizing the cannabis reform movement here in Texas? It give, is it, has it given them hope and, and inspired them to, to increase and fuel that uh, participation that we had in 2015? It, it certainly has given them hope, but that hope was present in all previous years. What okay. um, I, I would say that, that what kind of tipped the bucket this year was the parents getting involved and normal becoming more politically active. I think that in 2013, Texas normal was fairly active, but now DFW normal is getting involved, um, and they're using their really great organizing capacity to be able to get people out and train them in lobbying and how to talk to their representatives. And, and moving from activism to policy advocacy is a difficult transition for a lot of people, and, I, and the fact that they were willing to make that transition um, in a way that, that I think had a bit, a bit more impact with the politicians that we were working on. Um, but you know another thing that I continually say to folks is to stay you know because like I said we've been uh, encouraged by the successes elsewhere for a long time and every year we get people coming forward and they give it their all and there's nothing in different in the energy of the individuals going into this. We've always had these great wonderful individuals every two years working on the political process but what happens is is when they intersect and, and collide with the Texas political system um, a lot of them lose that faith because they realize well it's a short session every two years there's not a long time to move a bill through uh, the session and um, then we have the political hurdles of the amount of power that the chairs have over committees. I think that when people intersect politics like that, it, it, it is discouraging. And, but the key is the way the political system works is the fact that people are willing to keep coming back and not giving up and not letting go and uh, continue to put the pressure on the process. And I think that what you saw this last year was not only new folks coming in, but we saw a lot of the old folks coming back as well. Um, and I hate to say it, we've lost a lot of people to that, that philosophy of, of um, frustration uh, in regard to our political system. And it's a difficult pull to overcome when you keep hitting a political brick wall sometimes. But you've got to look for the cracks in it. And if you start talking to the representatives, you can see those cracks because you can see that the representatives are people with heart. You can see that the representatives in many cases, I believe, already agree with us, but they're looking for the political uh, will to do what they know is already right. So... Okay. You know. uh, 
frustration I'd like I'm going to comment on one of my frustrations of, about this session and I want your thoughts on it and that was the fact that of all the groups that you mentioned PAC, RAMP, uh, DFW Normal, yeah. uh, Texas for Responsible uh, uh, Marijuana Policy uh, which I think mm -hmm. was an umbrella of MPP all these groups, uh, the Texas Veterans Mm -hmm. All these groups were lobbying, uh, basically for uh, Simpson's HB 2165, uh, Marquez's uh, 3785, mm -hmm. and Nash Tats, uh House Bill 837, mm -hmm. and uh, Moody's Bill uh, HB 507. Mm -hmm. Those were the four main impetuses of their efforts, and the politicians and the powers that be without any input really from these organizations that we're talking about here went on ahead and passed a bill that none of us lobbied for are, are really um, I don't know anybody that was really pushing it in any of our lobby days our PAC days our veterans days the MPP lobby day nobody was really in the leadership of the uh, grassroots leadership of the cannabis movement was promoting this bill but it it got it got through. How did that happen? Can you do you have any insights you could give us on that? I think in some ways the politicians were looking for politically safe route to say that they're doing something, and they're going to find out this next session session that it wasn't enough because it wasn't enough to begin with, and we let them know that from the beginning. But they did not want to seem heartless in the face of you know Sanjay Gupta speaking out in favor of medical marijuana and his multiple documentaries about the the children they understand that um, the heartstrings of America are being tugged on um, by the stories of children and, and the truth is they should be tugged on by the stories of all patients um, but there's a, there's a special place in our heart for children and they realize that if they did not act at all that um, that it wouldn't go so well for them, that they wouldn't look so good in the eyes of humanity. And so they tried something, and they picked the most conservative way out, thinking that it would, um, I don't even know if I th think that they knew it would be enough or not, but they just didn't want to be seen to be doing nothing. And so in some ways, the fact that that did pass lends relevance to the narrative that we're putting forward. Um, the fact that they wanted to act but didn't act enough shows that there is some political will that is growing there. And even though it wasn't something that we were asking for, it was something that um, the Realm of Caring, for instance, came in and they were asking for. If I'm correct, it was the uh, Charlotte's parents came and testified for it. Um, not ironic at all that it would be the parents of the child that Sanjay Gupta had uh, discussed in his first weed video. So they wanted to be seen as doing something and certainly I hope that many children are helped by it but the, the fact of the matter is it just does not appear that that's going to be the case and in the next session we're going to have to let them know that that wasn't the case and um, that they need to do more, that they need to take that next step or they need to just do what needs to be done, what they know is correct. Um, what we need to show them is that they won't be politically punished. They're afraid of primary challenges. Um, and I wish I could remember the specific instance in East Texas. Now granted, this was what, like 10 years ago, but there was an instance in East Texas where there was a decriminalization bill that came up. A Republican representative from East Texas supported that and he was primary challenged and his support for decriminalization came up in the primary challenge and he lost and so politicians were paying attention to that and they are afraid of being punished in that primary challenge um, again I believe that the politicians personally may be on our side but we need to let them know where the political will is to do what they're doing and we need to know that when they sign on to that bill that we're gonna have their back all the way and um, and I think that that's going to happen. I do think that's going to happen. I think just right off the top of my head, I think two instances that really should send a great message to them for the next legislative session, and that's uh, Myra Crownover and uh, Scott Turner. 
who both both opposed any form of medical cannabis mm -hmm. or decriminalization, um, and um, but paid a political price for it. They've decided not to run again yeah. because of the immense pressure that has been put on them by grassroots people, and I don't think they wanted to face that. And they Absolutely. know that that storm and uh, that group of people are only going to get more vocal as the rest of the nation are getting more educated yeah. on the many benefits uh, to, uh, to medical cannabis and the amount of monies that we will save uh, from criminalization, uh, putting them in prison. Yeah. You know, even if we, you know, uh, the, the, the current, uh, the current status quo talk back is, well, we want to move them into rehabilitation. Well, when they do that, they also, they've got this huge parole system that's set up that costs billions of tax dollars. Yeah. And my point of view is that you don't need rehabilitation for something that doesn't really uh, make you an addict. Uh, some people are predisposed, but they usually have a genetic predisposition yeah. to mental illness of some sort. Yeah. They may need help, but they're a very small yeah. portion of the overall group. So really, we're rehabilitating people that really don't need yeah. rehabilitation. Total waste of taxpayer dollars. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? On that? Um, I mean, I'd agree with you. We're totally we are rehabilitating people that don't need it. Um, I do believe that those uh, the systems of aid need to be present, but I don't believe that they need to come with the long arm of the law of the parole systems and the prison systems. Um, and and I believe this from from all drugs really that people need to be able to seek help. And they need to know that our society is going to support them in that help, um, and that it's beneficial to us as a society to uh, do that rather than losing that person's contributions through uh, through prison and the effects of prison, which go beyond the prison walls into parole and even into the jobs that people can receive once they're done. When we choose to put someone in prison, we choose to give up on their gifts and. And I think that that's a tragedy, not just for them, but I think it's a tragedy for all of us. I agree 100%. It's a, it's a tragedy for them individually, for their families, and yep. then further into society itself. Yeah. It's, it's total, it's, a, it, it's, it is just a, a heartbreaking um, tragedy, tragedy, actually, is what it is. Yeah. Okay, uh, any last thoughts on the 2017th legislature? What, are, what do you think we should be doing? Uh, and we're, we're, what should we be preparing for for that legislature? Um, well, the first thing that I say is what I always say, uh, come back. Um, come back, we, you know, we have hit, in some senses, a brick wall this last time, but the wall is softening. And... Um, Take the righteous anger that you feel at the system and come back and turn it into righteous action because it needs us. It needs all those voices um, and it needs them to continue. And if you keep coming back, you'll see that the group, that the crowd is growing and that the, the, the sound of the crowd is, is growing as well. So um, I think that we need more organizations like RAMP and RAMP is doing a really great job reaching across the boundaries of politics to recognize that this is a bipartisan issue. The original bill for uh, the affirmative defense was actually written by a conservative sheriff, a Republican, Terry Keel. Um, it was carried on by Neistat when nobody else would carry it on. Um, early on in the bill, uh, we had a conservative co-sponsor, Jim Jackson, and it was a very difficult decision for Jim Jackson to make for many for many of his own reasons, but he did decide to support that bill. And we need to continue to seek those conservative relationships. And I say relationships in that we don't really get far by yelling at them because we have to accept that we have a lot of commonalities to begin with. We both care about our community and um, we want it to go places big. We want to, our, our community to be, be a safe place for our families and for our kids. And so let's have that conversation 
and let's continue to reassure folks that we can have effective um, policy reform and safe communities. Um, and we can have access to medicine for the sick and dying. We can have access to medicine for our children when they need it. Um, I, I believe that change is going to happen. Um, I don't know if it's going to happen this next session. I think that we should enter every session as though we're going to win. Um, but when we run into the challenges that are before us, we have to remember to keep going. Well, I appreciate your time very much, Stephen. Uh, thank you. And uh, we will uh, maybe, uh, maybe I could, uh, after the next uh, 85th legislative yeah. session is over with, maybe we can get together and have a, uh, another conversation about yeah. what transpired. Thank Absolutely. you very much.